use him as a human shield, and he looked up at his two colleagues. You boys playing on me? 66. Sam and Dom led the way back up the stairs, while Jack and the Afghan carried the incapacitated Reuters reporter. It was a tough climb back to the ground floor, but once they were there, things became even more precarious. Chavez had cleared the upstairs, but now he and Aldarcor were in the hallway near the stairs, firing toward the front of the building at enemy fighters positioned there. The Pakistani major had been hit in the left shoulder, and his rifle had been damaged by another round, but he continued to fire his pistol up the hall with his right hand. Chavez saw that he had six people behind him now, and one was being carried. He nodded to himself and patted Aldarcour on the shoulder. Let's find a way out of here before the enemy starts firing RPGs. They headed toward the back of the building, a limping Sam Driscoll in the lead with a salvaged AK. Now Chavez brought up the rear and fired constantly to keep heads down in the rooms and hallways near the front of the house. The hallway came to a T, and Driscoll went right, with the rest of the procession following behind. Sam came upon a large room at the back of the house, but the windows had been ripped up and there was no door. No good, he shouted. Try the other direction. Chavez went now. He was surprised that the enemy fire up this stretch of hallway had lessened noticeably. With Juan and Caruso firing down the base of the T, Chavez and Aldarpur darted across and then ran into a long, narrow kitchen. There was no exit here, but a small side door looked promising. Chavez opened the door, desperate to find a window or a door or even a staircase back upstairs. The doorway led to a dark room roughly 15 feet across and 30 feet deep. It seemed to be some sort of repair shop, but Ding didn't focus on the room itself. Instead, he shined his rifle's light quickly along the walls, searching for any other exit. Seeing nothing, he started to turn away to try to go back and fight with the others, but he stopped when something caught his eye in the low light. He had ignored the wooden tables and shelves in the room when looking for a way out, but now he focused on them, or more specifically, what was on them. Containers of car parts and electrical components, batteries, cell phones, wires, small drums of gunpowder, steel pressure plates, and a blue 55-gallon drum full of what Ding immediately assumed was nitric acid. On the floor were mortar shells partially disassembled. Dean realized he'd stumbled onto a bomb factory. The improvised explosive devices created here would be smuggled over the border into Afghanistan. This explained why the Haqqani fighters hadn't fired a rocket toward Chavez and his team here in the back of the house. If anything in this room detonated, the entire compound would be obliterated, the Haqqani men included. Mohammed, Dean shouted, and Aldar Kaur peered into the room. Immediately, he nodded. Bones! I know what they are. Can we use them? Muhammad nodded with a crooked smile. I know something about bombs. Ryan and Caruso were both down to their last magazine. They fired individual rounds from the top of the team down to the base. They knew they'd taken out a lot of the Haqqani members with rifle fire, but there seemed to be an unlimited supply of armed assholes remaining. One of the Pullman helicopters was flying in circles behind the compound. This Jack could tell from occasional automatic fire from the 6 o'clock high coming from outside the building. He could not actually hear the helo. With the gunfire in the narrow hallways, his ears were trashed, so nothing less than small arms fire up close or heavy machine guns at distance registered. Chavez appeared just behind the two men, sliding a fresh magazine around and into their chest rigs. While he did this, he shouted, There's a bomb factory!